This is an audio review of Chapter 8, LGBTQ Health and Wellness. So according to the Institute of Medicine, LGBTQ health can be understood through four lenses that we're going to briefly review in this lecture. So the first is the minority stress model that's briefly touched upon also in Chapter 7 that argues that chronic stress that sexual and gender minorities routinely experience can contribute to physical and mental health problems. The second is the life course perspective, which says that events at each stage of your life can influence the following stages. So they argue that LGBTQ people are particularly vulnerable in adolescence and young adulthood for issues that could affect them in the long term. Third is the intersectionality perspective that says that an individual's multiple identities and the way they interact with each other can compromise a person's health so that gender and sexual identity may be complicated by racial or ethnic minority status, by disability, by age, or other factors that can then result in more negative health outcomes. And the fourth is the social ecology model, which sees individuals as surrounded by spheres of influence and support, like family, friends, communities, and society that shapes self-efficacy and health. They define self-efficacy as the confidence that one knows how to live a healthy life, along with the intention, the actual resources, to make that happen as well. So those are our four that will shape the chapter's approach, and we're going to circle back to some of these throughout the next slides. Okay, so when looking at history and culture of medicine and LGBTQ people, LGBTQ people often have complicated relationships with medicine. So Foucault argued that queer sexualities in ancient times and in the medieval world were judged by religion and laws. But in the 1800s, sexualities became medicalized in the West. And so LGBTQ people were defined through these times in relation to the social understanding of the time they were in. So going from immoral to criminal to mentally ill in the way that they were defined. So when it comes to developing terminology, terms came about in medicine and science to try to account for variation. Theories of sexual variation came as a result, and they're trying to basically name the species or diagnose what they thought were diseases as they were mapping out their kind of more crude understandings of science than we have today. So all of the theories fall into five categories, and I'm going to briefly go over them here. They were the idea that homosexuality was innate, Darwinian theory, degeneracy theory, psychoanalytic theory, and behaviorism. So the first, <clears throat> that homosexuality was innate, according to Foucault, this was the assumption that comes from Greco-Roman antiquity and, and had been the case for many generations. While, you know, Darwin and his theories were felt in the 19th century, when ideas about genetics advanced and led to what was called third sex theory, so this is a little tangent, but still relevant. So Ulrich and Hirschfeld tied this term they coined, right, third sex theory, back to ancient times, specifically to Plato's Symposium, where an old myth was used to understand what's called the three primordial sexes. So this idea of male-male, female-male, and female-female. So according to the myth, humans are halves of ancestral people who belong to these three sexes, who Zeus punished by dividing them in two. So erotic love was basically an attempt of the halves to recover their nature by reuniting with their lost halves. So this accounted for men who desired men, men who desired women, women who desired men, and women who desired women. So important to Ulrich and Hirschfeld was that the sexual distribution was egalitarian and did not see same-sex desire as bad or different. It was, well, it was seen as different, but not lower on a social hierarchy. So Ulrich used the term third sex to describe himself when he came out as a homosexual to his sister. So again, that was a tangent, but maybe you learned something, maybe not. Okay, moving on. So Darwinian theory was all about evolution. And similar to what we talk about in my criminological course in regard to various racial and ethnic groups, right? And the poor and all these, you know, um, basically marginalized groups. These, this also applied these theories to LGBTQ community, right? Which basically all of them, all of the, the minority groups in society were just seen as evolutionary throwbacks or like less evolved. 
So this was connected to colonization so firmly, right? It was considered primitive to not hold European sexual mores. So when they colonized and they objected to those who had different sexual practices or ideas or races, right? And again, this is closely intertwined with eugenics, which also is a complicated topic to explore. But the best way to explore eugenics, I feel like, is baby Hitler. I'm sure you've heard that. I'm sure you've heard people say if they had a time machine, they go back, they kill baby Hitler. Not toddler, not adolescent Hitler, baby Hitler, which is weird. But anyway, as much as a sick madman he was, killing him would not attack the widespread Western belief in eugenics, which was considered a science at the time, which shows how prejudice and discrimination make their way into science and medicine. So eugenics said there's good genes and there's bad genes but they happen to be colonizer genes considered good and those who were oppressed or different in some way from the norm considered bad. So back to Hitler. He killed millions of Jewish people, but he also targeted other marginalized communities without as much outcry, right? Thanks to eugenic thinking. So specifically, he killed many people with disabilities and people who were considered to be queer. And this did not receive as much criticism in the world. Actually, again, there was this really terrible quote from the California experiment, which was a project that sterilized citizens considered unfit to reproduce, so they couldn't have kids because the government took away their ability to do so. But the guys who were running the California experiment, when they saw what Hitler was initially doing, right before the, you know, um, the full, you know, campaign, they basically said, you know, he's beating us at our own game. So I say all this to reiterate that there's always ideologies in place to justify inequality so that the dominant group remains unchallenged and how we interpret things like science have to do with our socio-historical time period, right? This is me getting all sociology on it. So our bias gets put into things like laws, science, religion, and other things that have long lasting profound negative impacts. Okay, so all of that is to set up degeneracy theory, which viewed homosexuality as akin to being a criminal or a drug addict or alcoholic, and use the ideas of genes from that time to say that it was inherited vice from a previous generation. Psychoanalytical theory was led by Freud, which had some interesting ideas and some other ideas which have been more related to his large quantities of cocaine that he consumed, but that's my bias popping in. So as you read in the other book for this class, Queer, A Graphic History, Freud was a huge influence on sexology and introduced the idea that sexuality is something that develops rather than being present since birth. But he did see some sexual attractions as less healthy or less mature than others. And the last one here is behaviorism, which is said that sexual orientation is learned behavior, so it can be unlearned with rewards and punishments to reprogram someone's sexual behavior which became the basis of an incredibly harmful gay conversion therapy, which is an attempt to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity or gender expression, which more than not being effective at all in actually changing people's desire, the goal was to change behavior. But what it really did was cause a lot of harm, such as causing higher depression, higher drug use, and being eight times more likely to attempt suicide. It taught people to hide who they were and internalize homophobia. Some of these camps were run by religious communities. According to UCLA Williams Institute, nearly 700,000 LGBTQ adults aged 18 to 59 in the U.S. have received conversion therapy, including about 350,000 that were forced into this in adolescence. Okay, moving into history and culture of medicine. So, Alfred Kinsey's research was important to changing long-held ideas about sexuality, and it introduced the idea of a scale for desire rather than a binary category of heterosexual or homosexual. So this is also explored in the graphic novel. His study was large and national and challenged assumptions, and he found that masturbation, sex outside of marriage, and diverse sexual practices were far more common than people assumed, and that more men and women than was you know, previously thought, had same-sex contact, and even more than that, had same-sex desire. By 1960, LGBTQ people had come to mistrust the medical establishment, and rightfully so, right? This makes sense. Healthcare providers were hostile or ignorant. Some rejected sexual orientation as a pathology that needed to be treated. So it makes sense that people would have distrust of such a system. 
So it was um, Christine Jorgensen, who was a celebrity who actually brought attention to being transgender when she publicly transitioned in the 1950s. And the chapter discusses the history of John Hopkins University, which was the first to study and perform what they at the time called sex reassignment surgery, which we now know as gender affirming surgery. But they stopped doing it in 1978 based on some transphobic research. And they only recently started providing this care again. So from the year 2000 to 2015, nearly 40,000 patients sought transgender care with about 11% opting for gender affirming surgeries. Okay, moving on to vulnerabilities across the lifespan and across intersectional identities. So decades of research has documented the disproportionate burdens of health problems and stigma for LGBTQ patients, like higher levels of depression, lower self-esteem, compromised academic achievement, and more substance and alcohol use. So going back to that minority stress model, they would argue that being marginalized produces personal and group stress. So the minority framework helps us understand health disparities for queer populations and shows how day-to-day -day life can be impacted throughout the life course. Under this model, there are what they call distal and proximal effects. Distal meaning victimization from others because of a minority identity and proximal meaning due to having to hide a sexual identity or gender expression and the impact of that internalized homophobia. Okay, moving on to intersectional identities, Intersectionality proposes that race, ethnicity, ability, disability, and other oppressed identities can amplify health issues for LGBTQ people depending on their specific social locations and identities. So it's important to understand the complicated intersections because this is what's going to help us provide better health outcomes. So moving to disease prevention and health promotion, gaps between heterosexuals and LGBTQ youth exist when it comes to health disparities, and research has shown that the best buffer against negative health experiences for these youth is family or parent support. Other support systems like school clubs and supportive peers are also very important, as well as supportive policies and laws. Among older LGBTQ adults, there's a strong focus on STD and STI and HIV prevention, which makes sense given HIV's disproportionate impact on the gay community. And in recent years, developments like the medicine PrEP have made it possible to limit HIV transmission. So the textbook asks, why aren't more men who have sex with men using this resource, you know, using PrEP? So researchers point to stigma and the history of distrust with the medical system, which can affect the use of life-saving drugs. So you can provide new medicines, but if you're not providing healthcare providers that actually understand or situations in which people can receive care without stigma or, you know, mistreatment, then obviously that's going to affect the likelihood of using these drugs. Okay, looking at transgender and gender non-conforming healthcare. Transgender and gender non-conforming people face barriers like mistreatment by providers, providers' discomfort or inexperience, and a lack of adequate insurance to cover healthcare needs. So when looking at epidemiology, estimates are about 0.6% or about 1.4 million Americans are transgender. But getting an accurate idea is hard, especially due to being marginalized from the institution of medicine itself. Also, cultural differences in different societies shape behavioral expressions or even interpretations of gender identities, which of course masks dysphoria or might not even be dysphoria depending on the cultural context. There's also a controversy over the diagnosis of gender dysphoria itself, since it was originally considered or seen as pathological. But to be clear, gender dysphoria and gender nonconformity are different, as not every transgender or gender nonconforming person experiences gender dysphoria, which is defined as the distress a person feels due to a mismatch between their gender identity and their assigned sex at birth. Okay, looking at therapeutic options for transgender and gender non-conforming patients. So transition is not linear, right? It's not a straight line. It's an individualized process that's based on a patient's specific needs and really, you know, what they want. So the following are some therapeutic options, though of course the chapter goes into more of them in depth. So some of them could just be changes in gender expression or role, which could involve things like 
chest binding or genital tucking. Um, you could have changes to name or gender marker on official documents. And so this is something that's getting better when it comes to the bureaucracy. Um, in years past, people would have to prove that they had undergone gender reaffirming surgery before they could even change these documents, which is an incredible hurdle, especially when it's very expensive. And a lot of people don't have the health coverage needed or their health insurance does not cover gender reaffirming surgeries. So, you know, having, having to hit that barrier and, you know, not everyone wants surgeries. So using that as a limitation to be able to get official documents, like such as, you know, a social security card or a driver's license with your actual gender and name on it. You know, things that, that heterosexuals and gender conforming people take for granted, right? As just, yep, that's something you can get. Um, you know, that can become a really big problem to navigating the world because we always need these documents. Um, another therapeutic option could be psychotherapy that investigates the construction of gender and just basically, you know, trying to unpack all of the negativity experienced in the past before going through the transition because it can be, it can be a lot to unpack a life's worth of all of that kind of, you know, stigma and mistreatment. Also, um, some other therapeutic options are gender affirming um, hormone therapy, which we'll talk about in a second, um, or surgeries, which could alter primary, primary or secondary sex characteristics. Um, you also have peer support groups and community organizations that can help, you know, provide support, mentorship, you know, a, a supportive community that can, you know, kind of help again we talked about a lot of those health outcomes that come from being by yourself through this process having people that support you really helps mitigate a lot of the negativity that can come with being more visibly out which again can um kind of cause more visibility and with that visibility comes a bit more vulnerability as you know um hateful bigoted people often target transgender communities so being visible can be dangerous in some ways, but having peer support, having community organizations can really help kind of create a space that is more comfortable and more safe for people to navigate within. Also, this could involve speech therapy, voice therapy, right, as another therapeutic option, or just hair removal. Okay, so looking specifically at hormone therapy, there's certain criteria people have to meet to receive hormone therapy and of course this differs in different areas but the physical effects of the treatment itself take about two to five years to go through so using hormones to masculinize the body would mean growing more hair on the face things like that redistributing muscles deeper voice among other changes like not having a period anymore while feminizing the body can include ch also changes in muscle and fat voice changes changes in libido and erections so the coming out process for transgender and gender non-conforming people can differ from other forms of coming out because the effects, especially if you're on hormone treatments, are noticeable to other people. And so that can come into play in social interactions. So having a lack of support through the transition process can be very challenging. And some people face mistreatment or harassment when they're transitioning. This also relates to the minority stress model, as many experience microaggressions due to their presentation of gender, such as you're in the wrong bathroom or things of this nature that make just simple things in daily life, like going to a public restroom, a minefield. So as a result, a lot of people experience, you know, increased health issues of depression and anxiety. So I just really wanted to briefly touch on the videos that were a part of this chapter, such as the video to treat me, you have to know who I am, which is part of a training series for healthcare workers to help them provide better care to LGBTQ individuals. So again, the goals of trainings like that are to reduce health disparities that the book has been reviewing in this chapter, and really to provide medical environment where patients receive quality care and respect regardless of their social identities. So please review the videos if you have not already. In the first one, you'll see stories from people who've experienced stigma and discomfort as a result of heteronormativity that's inherent in medicine, and the medical forms themselves, which will ask things in very traditional gendered ways. So the video explores different ways to provide real respect to all patients. The other video explores 
what it's like to provide trans care on an indigenous reserve in Canada. So Dr. Mykokos is a two-spirit Cree doctor who uses a unique approach to medicine, which incorporates acceptance and support and combining Western medicine with indigenous practices. So this is another great video, so please just take a few minutes to watch that if you haven't done so already. Okay, looking at being a smart patient and really just a smart healthcare consumer. So while some issues have been improving, there are still disproportionate discrimination in healthcare the LGBTQ individuals face. Some of this is due to a lack of inclusion in the training of healthcare workers when providers are prejudiced or ignorant. And this can cause, of course, health issues because some people are going to avoid seeking care if they feel like they're gonna receive, you know, or just have biased care or be uncomfortable in the process of, of seeking out medicine or just not have the doctor fully address their healthcare needs. Everyone is entitled to respect when seeking care and they deserve care that's culturally inclusive from their providers. So self-advocacy is something they talk about in the chapter as well, but it's also important to improve access to LGBTQ affirming quality healthcare. So first up with healthcare providers, those provider education programs um, nationally overall are inconsistent when it comes to teaching medical and nursing students about health issues that are unique to LGBTQ individuals. Some research shows doctors getting only five hours of education total in their training, and as low as a little over two hours for nurses. This means that healthcare workers may lack basic understandings of LGBTQ culture, terminology, and culturally inclusive care. Finding an LGBTQ affirming healthcare facility can be very challenging. So this is why some national organizations provide resources for LGBTQ people and healthcare providers such as the HRC, that has what they call the Healthcare Equality Index, that's a resource to find better providers. There's also the organization Health, Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality, called GLMA, which provides guidelines of care that people can take to their doctors to help them provide better care. So when looking at informed healthcare consumers, since not all providers are trained or supportive, LGBTQ individuals need to know what questions to ask when visiting their doctors. Disclosing information like your sexual identity to your doctor is important, but as the videos in the chapter demonstrated, not everyone's going to feel comfortable doing so, especially when they may receive negative response when they do. For instance, a young person in the first video spoke of how her doctor's friendliness evaporated when she disclosed that she was a lesbian. So it's up to the individual when and how and if they even want to disclose to their medical provider. Sometimes it can be helpful to bring someone supportive along. They can help mediate the uncomfort in these situations because no matter who you are, there's this power imbalance between doctor and patient. And just like other communities like women who've been long documented as not receiving full care due to healthcare provider bias, LGBTQ patients bringing support may help bridge those awkward conversations and help provide pushback against being dismissed or ignored. Also, there's an importance in paying attention to special health issues. Like I mentioned before, GLMA has these resource sheets that you know people can print out and take with them to help address the top health concerns that may not apply to everyone, but are typically common among LGBTQ people. So taking steps to minimize risk factors for illness is essential to a long, healthy life for all of us. LGBT Health Link is another resource in the chapter that can offer some advice on improving wellness. So the book offers other groups and various organizations that provide education and advocacy to help reduce inequality in healthcare. Obviously, healthcare workers should be trained and everyone should receive care that's attuned to them. But we know, especially in a capitalist, insurance-based, for-profit healthcare system, it's important that we all learn how to advocate for ourselves and our health when using medical services.